if you worked through all of the process, publishing your portfolio, going from the part of really creating your passion project and identifying the skills that you really want to project and showcase in your portfolio and then finally getting it published and you thought you were done, you were wrong. And here's why. Because your portfolio process all of a sudden goes from being creative to very bureaucratic when you start to use that portfolio to get a job. And why is that? I think it might be interesting for you to think about, again, as part of your plotting process, to understand what happens when that role actually gets published or posted on LinkedIn or monster.com, right? So the first step is that those, we post those, dis the hiring manager, is going to try to post a job description to attract the perfect candidate. They've written that job description based upon how they sold the need for that job to their management, maybe their upper management, the entire organization. They've probably had to compete to get that one position or maybe a couple positions open. So after they've gone through all of that work to justify hiring someone, a designer, a researcher, or anyone, they're going to create that job description that absolutely brings in that unicorn, that perfect candidate to meet every need that they used to justify opening that job. And then they start to screen people. So people start to apply against those job descriptions. And so they're gonna look at your application and your resume. Sometimes that's done by a machine that will go through and eliminate people and pull other people because it seems like the resume actually matches those needs a little bit better than others. So you could actually be selected into the interview process or selected out of the interview process based upon essentially word matching on your resume against the, the job description. And then, they're likely to look at your online portfolio. You haven't even talked to them yet, but they're going to go out and look for themselves and see, are you going to be a good match or not? This is where it's really important to showcase your, your passion project because you really want to get matched against a company and a job that matches what you love to do. And then ideally you get a phone interview. Someone from your dream company calls you and you're able to walk them through uh, one of your projects or multiples of your projects. And then if you get that far, the company is actually gonna make a big investment in you. So then the next process is to actually make the investment to pull you in for an interview. You may not think that that's an investment, but it really, really is from the hiring manager's perspective. They're either going to pull you in uh, on campus, pay for travel, maybe even pay for you to, to stay in a hotel if you're traveling a long distance, or if you're not and you're just maybe driving across town for an in-person interview, or maybe it's a remote interview. But the cost that the company is actually doing and investing in you is the time it takes to do that interview as well. So they're pulling maybe a loop, a full set of people who are going to interview you. That takes an investment to pull off. So be very mindful and recognize that they're actually wanting to make sure at that point that you're going to be successful. So then the next step is really screening people based upon the portfolio review and the interview itself. So now they're even making more of a commitment, right? They're going to really be looking at how well you did in the portfolio review and how well you presented yourself and, and convinced them and persuaded them, plotted to get the interview. But they're more and more and more and more and more invested in wanting to make sure that if they decide they want you, they really, really want you. Keep that in mind as a job candidate, right? At the same time, they're trying to make sure that you will be a good fit, right? That you have the skills that you promised to have. And if you don't, they'll figure that out along the way as well. But for the most part, right there at step three, 
it's changed to actually be more advantageous for you because they're making more and more and more of an investment. And of course, at some point, they'll either decide to make you an offer or they'll release you, right? And then the whole process starts of what does the whole package look like and negotiations occur. One thing you should think about is that really is your benefit. They've made a large investment that may not seem like it, but there's hours spent through this whole process trying to find the right candidate. So recognize that they really want you when they make that, that offer to you. You've got the upper hand in those negotiations. So plot away, right? It may feel very, very bureaucratic. And let's go back to really thinking about how your creative process of your portfolio becomes their job application, right? A couple of things you should think about here is, are you going to actually pivot your portfolio? And I love the description, the, the definition of pivot. It's really gravitating around a central point. And guess what? You are the central point, right? You get to choose whether you're going to pivot your portfolio around that particular job application. So let's think about those job applications, right? This is your opportunity to weave your expertise and your passions into their needs and expectations, right? You need to speak their language. So you need to look really closely at the job description itself. They may use terms that are synonyms. They mean the same thing as what you have in your portfolio. And you can decide whether you're going to change your portfolio to reflect what they are saying, right? And what their needs are. We were asked about whether it was a, what to do when jobs, when you're applying for more than one job, do you try to pivot your portfolio multiple times? You may decide that you really need to do that. You might actually have a different URL or a different PDF based upon each of the jobs that you're really truly after. But before you get to that actual process, it's important to look at uh, what you can learn from the job description itself. Each job description a lot about that particular company's culture and what their expectations of you will be. So, this is, a, this is a very, very wordy slide, but what I'll tell you is the, the items there in the colored box are actual descriptions, bullet points on different jobs, right? So I'm just gonna read this and really think about how does this job, what does this job description requirement reveal about the organization and the company? What is it going to be like if you were to apply and actually get that job and think about how you might need to pivot your portfolio because that's the type of job you really want. In this particular example, this company said that the work will be 30% visual design, 70% user experience, but you're not expected to design the color screen, the color scheme and the logo that's being done by a design firm. Well, what could that possibly reveal? That might reveal that they're very reliant upon a design firm. Are you gonna have to compete and get approval from that design firm? What's that gonna be like if you don't actually have ownership or control or even input around uh, the, the color palette, right? Is that something that's important to you? Or are you okay with having another group or another design firm contributing their expertise as well? It could go really positively and it could go negatively. And it's probably something you need to find out and poke around during your interview process. And you need to determine, is this, is this a requirement that you might wanna change and pivot your portfolio around? Here's a couple more examples. So this particular company actually wanted the, you as a candidate and potential employee to maintain mock-ups and usage scenarios, prototypes, right? Navigation maps, design documents. Well, what does this one reveal? To me, this actually sounds like they, they may not know exactly what they want. They 
have probably heard some jargon terms around mock-ups and scenarios and prototypes, but they may not actually know how all of those pieces come together. Um, they may just be pulling things out of thin air to think that maybe there's someone out there who has examples of all of these things. Um, I don't want to paint it as a negative. It also is an opportunity to really think about, wow, this is a very broad design job. And you have an opportunity to do a lot of different things there. But you got to really think about what this job requirement reveals about the company. And how might you best project your expertise if you want that job, if it really sounds interesting. The next one, this is another, a different company, these are all different companies, it suggests that they need their designer to package design for the development team to essentially implement. So what does that mean? You might start to think about what are the, when are the handoffs between design and development? And who's your end user? Is your end user the person who's going to be using your design? Or is the end user that you are really tailoring all of your design assets for the development team. So think about what this one means in terms of uh, the design process and who you're doing your design for. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply for the position, but it definitely reveals some things around the structure of the company and it merits having some questions, right? And, and listening through the process, the interview process, for things that might be concerning. At the same time, it might be really exciting to be able to package a design and have enough detail and just know that the development team is going to take that and run with it, right? So it can go either way as being something that is hmm, a warning sign or something that's really a golden opportunity. And you're going to need to poke around a little bit with the hiring manager and during your interview process, what you can learn. A couple more. So this is one where the designer is expected to be a user researcher, as well as a visual interaction and conversational designer. This one kind of feels like maybe you're the only or the first person in that company to do design. And then also, you might be expected to do some data science too. So if you've got really well-rounded skills and you love to do deep, <laughs> deep work and multiple design skills, this might be a great spot for you. Especially if you go back to when you were thinking about your passion projects, maybe you were actually having difficulty thinking about what the UX skills are that you're really passionate about and aligning that to your, your passion project. This might be a great one for you if you really had some difficulty kind of distinguishing your passion project from other work, right? But think about this in terms of, this is going to be a pretty broad job, potentially. So this one is really interesting. This requires you to have a security clearance and take a lie detector test before you can prove that you qualify for the job. This is a real job requirement from a UX, uh, job description. I believe this one was actually with the military. So they really want to make sure that you've got, um, you're at the right, that you're a valid and secure person. What this also potentially means to think about is, well, if they've got lots of stringent requirements before you've even joined the team, they may have very stringent requirements around how you do design and how you document design. This could be a great position if you're very detail-oriented and have a, a kind of a step-by-step a, a -step process. This might be a, a job that you'd be really interested in. And there might be really a reason why you have to have that security clearance. You might get to work on some pretty interesting projects too. And the last one, another company said the most important thing is having a sense of humor because it's so fun to work here. That sounds great. Everybody likes to have fun. If you can have fun while you're working, that's great. How would you actually need to potentially change your portfolio to show that you're fun? And then also think about this a little bit in terms of, might this be a signal about their culture that 
maybe the expectation is that it's so fun to work here, you don't mind working 60, 70 hours a week, it might just be a signal of things that you might want to pay attention to. And maybe for the right project and the right opportunity, you'd be willing to put in that effort, extra effort, especially if it was fun. But think about that. So really, um, take a few minutes to think about what would actually merit you changing or pivoting your portfolio around job requirements. Uh, you might actually want to go out and look at some jobs that maybe you've applied for or things that you're interested in and read through specifically the job requirements and see what you can find and what it reveals. But minimally, maybe go back in the video a little bit, reread those job requirements and, and think for a few minutes around what would merit you changing and pivoting your portfolio because it merits doing so. The job is so interesting and so intriguing to you that you'd be willing to change. Next, you really want to think about what's your ideal job. So what is the ideal role for you that you would want to take on next and the company that you would want to work for or the management that you would thrive or struggle under? It might really be helpful to, to write these things down because when you're in the middle of the job process, the hiring process, and maybe you've got multiple uh, companies that you're considering, it really helps to go back to what you originally set out as your goal. What is the, what's the passion project that you do and what's the work that you want to continue doing? Is there an ideal company for you? Do you want a small company where you are um, kind of the, the sole owner of design or the design work? Would you rather work in a larger company that has a community of designers? And what kind of manager would you really thrive under? How do you go through the interview process sort of testing for and getting a sense of who that hiring manager is and whether they actually match what you are looking for? So take a few minutes when you can as you're going through this hiring process to think about and, and write down what it is that you're really looking for so that when that time comes and you're giving um, you've been given a job offer and again remember that's the perfect time you've got kind of a, a leg up on the on the hiring manager and the hiring company to really think critically not only about what they're offering you but whether that is really your ideal job or not And remember that your creative process of creating your portfolio and showcasing your work eventually will become a mini portfolio interview. So you typically will go through that process of applying for the job, and then you have a situation where you're needing to conduct a phone interview with someone. There's some activities that you can think about here as well. So imagine that you have landed that phone interview. Someone probably, a recruiter or a scheduler has reached out to set up that phone interview, right? You need to think about how you're going to present your passion project, how you're going to talk through it. You may only get an opportunity to do it over the phone. Very likely it'll be more of an opportunity for you to share your screen and walk through your design or your, your passion project, or it might be an opportunity for them to pull it up themselves and have you walk through it. Think about those different options and what makes the most sense. Imagine telling your story, though, to different people at your dream company. Because really, when the person is interviewing you and they're interested, you don't know who necessarily is going to conduct that interview. And so we're going to kind of encourage you to role play and think about, again, your passion project, that work that really showcases what you love about user experience and how you would describe that to the following people and the following roles. I, I would suggest maybe pausing after my discussion on each of them and think about and maybe practice how you would tell your story to the person that is on the other side of the phone. You'll see in just a second. So the first one, the easiest one, is 
pretend you're per describing your passion project to your best friend. Your best friend, of course, is very interested in your work and loves to hear you talk, right? So describe that passion project to someone that you know is very interested in you and is very interested in your work. Pause for just a few seconds here before we move on to the next one. Next, imagine that you have on the other side of the phone, Omar, who works for HR, right? From experience, recruiters don't necessarily know all that much or anything about user experience, but they're still, they still have been asked to review your portfolio and conduct that initial interview. So now the challenge is telling Omar, the recruiter, about your favorite UX project in terms that he would understand, right? Probably is a little bit different of a discussion than talking to your best friend. You have to be a little bit more clear in what your jargon terms are, right? May not understand what visual design is. So think about how you translate your passion project to someone who may not actually understand. But also, don't assume that all HR recruiters don't understand user experience. Some of the larger companies have dedicated recruiters for user experience. Don't make the assumption that just because you're talking to a recruiter, they don't understand user experience. But recognize that you may need to change your terminology a little bit and be a little accommodating, or maybe toward the end of that discussion or the, the end of your portfolio review, just check to see if it made sense and if there was anything else that they needed to hear or wanted to ask you about. It's always good to kind of reflect back to the recruiter and ask the recruiter if there's anything more they needed to, to understand or if you made sense to them or not. Next one is imagine a developer who also knows something about user experience, but they may not be an expert. And in fact, the developer may not have had the greatest experience with, with, with user experience person, right? Maybe they actually are on this interview because they want to make darn certain that they hire that designer who's going to really explain everything in detail and not design something that goes beyond the scope of the current project or is going to be really difficult to develop. Think through um, how you convey your passion project to a person who knows something about it, but isn't really passionate about user experience. May not know everything that you as a designer or a researcher knows. And maybe is a little bit disappointed in previous experience that they've had. Other developers may really love, love user experience and want to understand what your process is and how everything, how everything came together and how you conveyed the concept and the functionality to the developer. So just think about how you will translate your passion project to someone who has worked with user experience but isn't a user experience person. What about if you have the opportunity to talk to the CEO at your dream company, right? CEO who's way up in the project in, in the company may not know all of the details of experience, or maybe they do. But how would you actually convey your passion project to a CEO? I think that they would probably be interested in the actual impact that your project has had on the company or on the end users, right? You probably need to think about how do you translate your story into metrics, right? And into describing the impact that you've been able to have. It's perfectly great if you can show your passion for design and experience when you're talking to that CEO. Just be mindful that they're looking at it potentially from a different perspective. And how do you help kind of bridge that gap between what they know and they understand and what really constitutes what they need from a designer versus where you are and how you're able to, to talk about it as well. 
right? And lastly, what if you were just kind of contacted by a stranger at your dream company who found you on social media and just wanted to hear about your project or your experience, right? You may not know anything about what their expertise is. So do you actually spend a little bit of time asking them what their role is or, or what um, they understand about experience? Do you um, take them step by step? What's your approach to talking about, some, talking about your project with someone who may not understand user experience at all? And really, unlike your best friend who just loves hearing every word you, hangs on every word you say, an internet stranger, or maybe someone that you meet at the grocery store or next to on a plane when we're all flying, um, won't have the same expertise, won't have that same vernacular, the same words that you use to describe user experience. It's really great to kind of think through how you represent and showcase your work to different people under different circumstances. So take a few minutes here and just really think about your passion project and, and go back through and think about how would you describe it differently for people that are in a, a different situation. Ultimately, you really need to decide again when you want to pivot your story and how you do it on the fly, right? That pivot is really the, the opportunity you have to focus your story from their perspective, but you're still the center of that pivot. You just need to figure out how your words change, how what's important changes a bit. It's still your story, but it has a slightly different plot line if you will. So think about that. When are you willing to pivot? So eventually, when all goes well, you've published your portfolio, you've filled out the application, you've gotten the mini phone interview, right? Portfolio review, you land that face-to-face -face job interview. What are some of the best practices? in pitfalls. So I have some principles based upon real experience and some embarrassing pitfalls that I'll share as well. Did you want to stop? We will. So then again, your creative process, if everything lines up and you go through publishing your portfolio, and getting through the job application and the mini portfolio review, you hopefully land that interview. It may be face-to-face, -face, it may be remote, but the intention is for you to actually walk through your portfolio, right? I recommend only a couple projects, not necessarily your entire portfolio, but now I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm about to reveal to you some of the best practices, the best principles for portfolio reviews, and some rather embarrassing pitfalls that I've seen candidates do as well. So first, the first principle is really follow any instructions that the company provides. Again, companies will reveal a lot to you in how they ask you to demonstrate and participate in a portfolio review. I have uh, different instructions that I, that I ask my, my HR counterparts to send out based upon the actual level of the position that I am interviewing for. The lower level, more entry level, actually help um, articulate how to spend their time in the portfolio review. So I actually give kind of entry level, maybe interns, a little bit more guidance around spend five minutes telling us about yourself, 15 minutes on your first project, 15 minutes on your second project, leave time at the end to wrap up and answer any questions. It's important if you get those kinds of instructions that you follow them. It's a pretty good guideline for what the manager is expecting. At the other end of that spectrum, 
I will provide very little instructions to someone I think is more at the, the senior level or someone who needs to fill a senior level position. So typically those folks will get instructions like, You'll have an hour to conduct your portfolio review to a variety of people, including UX team members and others. Um, the, the time is, is yours to use however you choose. And what I'm looking for there is I'm really wanting to make sure that they use their time wisely. They really think through what's the best way for them to share their experience, because that's what I'm going to expect them to do when they're on the job. And I have a couple of other little ones in between entry level to senior level. The thing to think about too, when you're reading those instructions that the company provides is, are you gonna be comfortable working for a hiring manager who provides that kind of uh, guidance to you? Are you more of a senior level person and they're trying to tell you exactly how to spend your time? That, that might be a signal that they're going to be a little bit more of hands-on manager versus maybe you're entry level and they're just letting you wing it. That might be an indicator to you that you're going to just wing it on the job. And it might not be the best place for you to get the best experience and expertise that you really need. So pick up on the, on the cues that they have and recognize that maybe some companies just have standard template that they send out to all candidates, but whatever the instructions are, really pay close attention and follow them. They reveal a lot and they, the intention is to make you successful in the portfolio review as well as the job itself. Oops. Next, you're gonna to wanna to create a deck or a PDF document separate from your online portfolio. Wow, seriously, I'm encouraging you to go out and create this entire portfolio of your work and your passions, and now I'm giving you advice to take it offline. I have to tell you that I've really tried to think through in all of the interviews and portfolios that I've reviewed over the years, and it's probably, there's been hundreds of interviews that I've conducted with candidates you've come in for a portfolio review. I cannot think of a single person who did a good job in their portfolio review when they just went out to their website and started talking about their portfolio. It is so easy for them to get distracted and to change their mind and wanna go into the detail that they think is important that may not be. And it's because they didn't actually select what they wanted to talk about. And they got very, very distracted when they were in the room um, and looking at their beautiful work and trying to figure out where they wanted to go next. It just does not work really well. It's much easier to be in control of your story when you know exactly <clears throat> how your story, your, your presentation, your work samples go from here to here, from here to here, right? What's the flow? What's the story that you're trying to tell? I can't emphasize this enough, that you really, really want to get to the few great parts of your story and don't try to tell everything and show off your online portfolio. I just can't think of a candidate who's done that really well. And in fact, I can think of candidates who, because they went out to an online portfolio and got lost and distracted, that they didn't get further in the process. We were able to determine that they really weren't going to be a very good match for what we needed them to do. Next, I, I, it's really important to have a presence. So especially in a face-to-face, in -face, you establish your presence by coming into the room and greeting the people, right? Have a smile on your face. Be somebody that people want to work with, right? Showcase that you are not just your expertise, but that you're a human as well. And in remote interviews, it's really, truly important for you to really carry yourself well and be kind of entertaining in your portfolio review, right? Again, 
there's been an investment made to pull all these folks into the room and listen to you. So make it worth their time to hear you speak, right? This is your opportunity to really brag, smile, and engage. So strive to make those connections with the people in the interview room. Again, it, this is an important thing to do as well. It sounds kind of silly, but take a deep breath. Relax. This is your time. You get to be the center of attention. Everyone's going to be paying attention to you. That's a great, great feeling. It can be a little nerve wracking. It can be a little scary, especially if you're more of an introvert, right? But people are understanding that you may be nervous. People are in the room. They want to see you do a good job. They're invested in wanting to see that you're going to be successful. So take a deep breath, relax, be human. It's okay. If there's time in the room, if you've got, if you haven't been late and you haven't been having technical difficulties, invite people to introduce themselves and think about how helpful it was when you were practicing just a few minutes ago on the walking through your uh, passion project based upon the roles of the people on the other side of the phone. It's the same thing in your face-to-face -face interview. It's really helpful if you know who the people are in the room and what role they play. And extra points, if you actually pull out a sheet of paper and draw a map and put people's names on that map. I've seen mostly researchers do that because they're when they have to conduct a focus group, they want to call people out by name, so they, they write people's names down. But it's a really effective way to have a presence and call people by name and recognize that you may have leaders in the room. You may have developers in the room. You may have business or marketing or designers in the room. It's good for you to know who's in the room because then you can tailor your presentation and your portfolio a little bit, pivot it, just slightly to the people who are in the room. And you get to call them by name. That feels personal. Share just a little bit about yourself, right? People want to connect with you as a person. And I say a little bit because I've actually had a job candidate who had a screen that had his picture, his dogs, pictures of his dogs, and his children and literally every place that he's ever visited and it was 45 minutes into an hour-long portfolio review before he got off that first page so don't share too much plan to share a little bit about yourself and just for fun i want you to think back to when i introduced myself at the beginning of the session the previous session what do you remember about it? Do you remember maybe that I helped launch Office 365 or Amazon Business? Or maybe you remember a little bit more of those tidbits about working with prisoners or running the train, the plutonium train from one chemical lab to another chemical lab. Those were all intentional sort of keys that tried to make me a little bit more interesting. Right? And if I'd been doing my portfolio and had brought in a couple of those stories, guess what? The people that I'm interviewing with later on might pull that story in and chat with me just a little bit about that particular experience. The one that stands out the most was when I worked at the, with the prisoners. I've had so many people say, hey, if you can work with prisoners, you can work here, right? It's a great little story that people connect with and it just makes me feel a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more human in the interview process. And I've seen candidates do it really effectively well, as really effectively too, especially when the team gets together and talks about them. Sometimes those, just those little tidbit stories kind of pop and we all sort of make a connection to that candidate. We're less likely to turn someone down who we've made a little bit of a connection with. So take that opportunity to share just a little bit of information about yourself in an interesting way. It's always really important to describe
describe your UX process as well. You're going to be expected to kind of come in and either adapt and adjust to an existing UX process or potentially you're one of the new people, newest people on the team and you're gonna to have to establish a process, right? So spend just a little bit of time articulating what your process is and maybe include what parts of that process you find most interesting, most important, or that have had the biggest impact on really helping you gain confidence in your results, right? If, if you can describe that, people have a better process of understanding it, the work that you're about to present, and they may also talk to you about your process later on as well. It kind of grounds them in a way that they can talk to you about your process. But again, don't do too much unless you're, unless you're applying for a studio manager job or perhaps a UX manager job. Then process is even more important. Now, always demonstrate user-centeredness, right? When you've introduced, you've had the candidates introduce themselves, I think it's a really great idea to understand who they are and then turn around and say, okay, here's kind of my agenda or the topics to choose from. I have four or five projects that I could share with you. Which one would you be most interested in? And what you're doing is you're giving some control over to the group in the room. And you may find that they're most interested in the mobile app rather than the web design that you did, right? That tells you a little bit about maybe what they're looking for uh, in, in their next hire, right? And it also means that you've got enough confidence in all of your work that you can adjust on the fly a little bit and you can follow what they want you to do. It's just a nice touch. And then really dive deeply into about two or three projects. Don't, don't try to show everything that you've worked on. Uh, if you can talk more deeply about two, maybe have the third in your appendix ready to share, um, I think you're going to engage a little bit more deeply with your, with your group. Sometimes you might want to talk about what the before was as well as the after, demonstrate what the change was, showcase what part you worked on, but you don't have to go through, don't, don't make the mistake of trying to show a lot of work a little bit, rather show a little bit a lot. Dive deep. People want to know that, you've, that you have the whole story. They want to know the details behind the work that you actually did. And lastly, conclude with an intriguing summary slide, right? What's that, that piece of information that you can leave them with? Is there a, a summary as you understand based upon the job description? It sounds like you're looking for these skills and you can actually show check, 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 check. You've got those skills. And this was the work sample that, that demonstrated that. Or maybe there's not a direct match between the job skills and the work that you showed in the portfolio. Well, why not make that evident, right? If there's five things and you were able to show three in your portfolio, then you can say, and I really look forward to talking to you about these other things that, uh, that seem to be important based upon the job description or based upon the interview that you had over the telephone, right? Wherever you're actually harvesting some of that information, it might be kind of fun and kind of interesting to be able to showcase how you really can effectively meet that hiring manager's needs, right? Remember that that hiring manager has gone through so much work to get approval to post this position. Keep reminding them how you meet those needs and how you're gonna be a really great hire. And that intriguing summary slide may just do it. Regardless of the outcome, right? Be grateful. You've had this great opportunity to build and, and drive this showcase of yourself, right? And if you're really honest and you strive to meet their needs and they decide that you do meet the needs, you can be grateful. 
if you just if they decide that you're not going to meet the needs and you're not a good case a good match and you don't get the job be grateful for that as well you should feel so much better knowing that you know what it wasn't a match uh you were not probably going to be um successful there because what you were absolutely passionate about wasn't what they were looking for and that's okay be grateful that you didn't end up in that situation you can go to the next the next option and land someplace that really really harvests your passions and of course congratulate yourself you have been through a lot at that point and it's good for you to be able to say you know what you told your story and you are true to what your passions are. That is truly, truly important. Now, let me share a couple of embarrassing pitfalls. These are real. People actually did this. So, first off, don't assume that your portfolio is going to be beautifully showcased on a wide screen or even a great TV monitor. It may come as a surprise that Amazon does not have a lot of projectors in the room. In fact, when I was there and we were scrambling around to have a portfolio review, sometimes we were competing with other design teams for the one conference room on three or four floors in the building that actually had a projector that we could use. And so we'd, we'd have to schedule it with the other design teams because Amazon was so document driven um, we really didn't have a lot of ways to show, show each other's work, and it was really awful when someone would come in and try to showcase their portfolio and expect it to be really beautifully projected because Amazon is a big company. Mm, just didn't happen that way. So make sure that you've got a way to showcase your work beautifully, even if the equipment isn't there. Secondly, be sure not to take credit for other people's work. I literally have been in situations where my team work, my team's work was being projected and showcased by someone who was not on the team. She literally, or he, he or she, literally walked through and took credit for someone else's work. Don't get caught in that situation because um, you'll be expected to be able to describe the ins and outs of that work. And if you can't do it, you're going to look really, really foolish. Now, it's possible that your work is built on the shoulders of others, right? And you are able to uh, iterate something and make it even better. Well, in that case, you should always celebrate the past, right? If your work was, um, an iteration of someone else's, be sure to just acknowledge that there's other people who had done work before you. Don't be critical of the work that was done before you. That's, you don't know who's in the room and who actually had done that work previously. And this is a minor one, but it's, it's a little embarrassing and it happens fairly frequently where someone will pull up their story and they'll go on to their next project and they'll go, oh, I forgot I included that one. It sounds a little odd, and it sounds a little bit uh, like you're not very well prepared. You can get over it, and no one's going to be really critical of you, but I've seen it happen so frequently that I have to, I have to imagine that people aren't actually practicing or really thinking through uh, what work they're going to show, or they're not choosing to show the work that really aligns to their passions, because if they really, really are confident about their work, it would be no big deal. Um, and they would know what to expect next and be able to project it uh, really effectively. So number four, it kind of goes without saying, right? But don't come in and insult or fault your partners. I've seen so many people come in and maybe speak derogator derogatorily about the developers or marketing or the leadership team or blame somebody else for the situation that they found themselves in. This is really unfortunate, especially if the people that you are blaming and sort of faulting are in the same role as the people that are in the room, right? Nothing is more embarrassing than 
if you are blaming and saying that someone on your team just didn't know how to uh, code things a certain way and your coders are in the room. What they're hearing when you say that is that you're going to blame them for whatever default problem your design has. Don't do that. It's really um, quite interesting how often that actually happens. I mean, it just doesn't land well in the room. And lastly, I know this sounds crazy and it sounds like something that no one would do, right? You wouldn't do this. But we, I have literally had um, a candidate in particular, a couple that I might have thought were drunk, one who really was very drunk in the interview loop. Um, tried to give her her portfolio review, walk through her work, and really I'm astonished that she didn't fall on her way out. So the other reason that I tell you this is that regardless of what pitfall you find yourself in when you're doing your portfolio review, it will never be that bad because you're going to be smart enough to not be drunk in your interview process, right? You will never be the showcase of the worst possible portfolio because you won't make that mistake. Ultimately, your whole creative process will become a happy ending and you will find a job that meets your passions and your expectations and you'll be able to really bring your best self to work. A couple more things is really please Visualize your portfolio process as pleasant and delightful. It is your opportunity to really showcase your work, right? Bring it all together, align it to what you really want to do. A, ma a hiring manager wants to hire you into a role that you are excited about, right? Apply for that role that you will be excited about showcase your work and hope, hope for the best that they're going to actually agree with you and want that work on their team. It should be a pleasant process. It shouldn't be a dreadful task. I know it's a lot of work. There's a lot of steps involved. There's a lot of considerations, but think about it pleasantly and recognize that it's really your opportunity to showcase yourself. That's it. Thank you very much. Really, truly appreciate the opportunity to share some of the principles and pitfalls of the portfolio process. And please, if you get a chance, reach out to UXSA. They are craving your help. They're always looking for volunteers and they have a great opportunity potentially to help you get that passion project that you can reflect in your portfolio. So think about where the gaps are in your portfolio, and I bet they can help you close that gap. Thanks.